So today we're going to talk about probably one of the most famous language problems in computer science, the halting problem. And that problem is a language which consists of strings that are the encoding of a Turing machine and an input to that Turing machine. And this string is in that such a string is in the language H if and only if when the machine is run with the string it halts. So essentially the halting being able to say that a particular string is in H or not in H and being able to say that all the time means that we are actually able to decide if a program will halt on a particular input or not. And that would be an incredibly helpful thing to be able to know, to be able to decide for, uh, for certain. And in this video and the next video, we're going to show that, that actually it's impossible to, to decide this problem. So I need you to remember what the set SD and D are, the set of semi-decidable and decidable languages. I want you to remember what it means for a Turing machine to semi-decide a language, and that is, if a machine is given a string, in that string is in the language, then the Turing machine must halt and accept. But if the string is not in the language, then M can either reject or just loop forever. So it is slightly less strict than the definition for deciding a language, in which case the machine must always halt and must always say either yes or no. In the case of semi-deciding, all the machine has to do is halt and accept if the string is in the language. And the final thing is we want to talk about decision problems as languages. So that is, if we have a problem where we have to decide yes or no, then we can almost always model those as a language in which the instances of the problem correspond to strings that may or may not be in the language. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is what the universe of all strings is going to be when we're talking about languages that involve the encoding of Turing machines. So normally, when we have a language, the universe that, that language sits in is the clean of the alphabet. So all of the strings that can be possibly made up with the symbols in the alphabet are the universe, and the machine that we want to build to decide the language has to correctly decide for every single one of those whether or not the string is in the language. So if we have an encoding, if we have a language that consists of the encoding of machines such that that machine halts on some string, for example in this case epsilon, for a string to be in the language it has to satisfy two things. Firstly, it has to actually encode a Turing machine. Now, if you remember back to the universal Turing machine, we can encode uh, Turing machines using a particular alphabet, but you can see how we could easily build a bunch of strings from that alphabet that did not correspond to actual Turing machines. So for a string to be in this particular language that we're talking about now, it must actually represent a Turing machine. And the second thing it must be is that that Turing machine must halt when given the empty string as input. So whilst, like I said, we normally consider the uh, clean of the alphabet of that language, but that makes describing the complement of this language more complicated. Because if we want to say the complement of L, then we have to say that is all of the strings which encode valid Turing machines which do not halt on epsilon, and all of the strings which do not encode valid Turing machines at all. But how about we assume this part is true? And that's not a problem for us when it comes to talking about the decidable and semi-decidable languages, because that problem is decidable. It is definitely possible to look at something built up from the alphabet of the universal Turing machine and say that that is a valid Turing machine or that's not. That's a very easy syntactic problem, so we can decide it. So being able to figure out part one does not affect whether or not the language is in the um, decidable languages or the semi-decidable languages. So if instead of considering this to be our universe, we instead consider the set of all strings that, sat, that are part of that and satisfy part one, we can talk about a simpler concept when we say the complement of L. Because if we consider the universe to be all of the 
strings that form syntactically correct Turing machines, then the complement of L now just becomes the set of encodings of a machine which does not halt on epsilon. And we can see how that makes more sense to us when we're talking about L versus not L, because that's what we cared about. We didn't really care about strings that don't represent a Turing machine. So one of the things that we're going to do when we're up here at the higher level talking about Turing machines is we're usually going to assume a slightly different universe, and that is the universe of strings which encode valid Turing machines. And by this part here, you can see that that is not a problem when it comes to talking about whether or not the language we are discussing is decidable or semi-decidable. So after that complicated, long-winded explanation, we can now talk about what the halting problem is. So the halting problem is the set of strings which represent the encoding of a machine and the input to that machine such that the machine halts on that input. So because we talked about the universe before, the universe in this case consists of valid, syntactically valid encodings of Turing machines and their inputs. So we don't have to worry about things that don't represent a valid input or a valid Turing machine syntactically. Being able to decide this problem, as I said in the introduction, is a very, very helpful tool because if we could run that, then in theory we could take any program that you guys write and any input that you want to put into that and then say beforehand, if we can decide H, that this will not halt. This will either halt or loop forever. And being able to tell that would be a very helpful debugging tool. So the first thing that I'm going to prove is that this problem is actually semi-decidable. So it's not all doom and gloom. I'm going to show you in the next video that it's not decidable, but it is at the very least semi-decidable. So we know it's not as complicated as languages can possibly get. We can at least say yes if the machine would halt on the string. We just might not be able to stop and say no. So to prove a language is semi-decidable, all we have to do is construct a Turing machine which semi-decides it. So remember, the, a Turing machine will semi-decide the language as long as if it is given an input, a string that is actually in the language, it is guaranteed to halt and accept. But all we care about is that when it is given a string that is not in the language, that it doesn't accept. That's the only criterion. It can reject or it can just never ever halt and that's fine. So we will build a Turing machine which will halt and accept if it is given a, uh, a Turing machine which does halt on its input, but when it uh, is given a Turing machine which and an input pair which is not part of the language H, will show that our Turing machine will actually loop forever. So let's consider this Turing machine MH. It gets given as input pairs of encodings of Turing machines and their input and all it does is simulates that Turing machine on W and then when it's finished doing that it accepts. So you can see how what MH does is it gets the encoding of a Turing machine and its input and then it puts the input into a simulation of the Turing machine that it has been given and then once that's finished it just says yes. So we can see how if this machine M that we've been given does halt on this input here then this pipeline will pass through and will go through and accept. Now we also need to show that it will. this our MH machine will never accept if this machine, if the input is not in the language. And we can see that's the case because if the encoding MW is not in the language H, then it definitely does not halt on that input. So our Turing machine will simply be sitting in here simulating a machine which never halts. So at no point can it ever get out here. So our machine, therefore, semi-decides the language H because it will halt and accept if this machine halts, but if the machine does not halt, then it definitely does not halt, then our machine does definitely not ex accept. In actuality, our machine will always live forever as well. So that's it, it's not particularly complicated. But a few things that you should have gotten from this video was 
what the universe of strings that we use when we talk about languages that involve encoding Turing machines. So it may be the set, if the language is defined just on encodings of Turing machines, then it will be, the universe will be all valid encodings of Turing machines. Or if it's a language that's defined on Turing machine input pairs like this, then it will be the language of all syntactically valid Turing machine input pairs encoded. Another thing is you should see from this how we can prove a language that involves Turing machine definitions is semi-decidable. In almost all cases, we the definition of our machine which semi-decides the problem is the machine simulates the uh, machine it has been given as input and then does something based on what that simulation is. And a final thing you should have gotten from this is that the whole thing problem is semi-decidable. That is, H is in SD.